Welcome to this presentation about the life and times of Takabuti. Today, we hope to show how researchers in different disciplines but working together can piece together some key features in the life and death of a woman named Takabuti, who lived some 3,000 years ago. We'll address questions including who was Takabuti, when did she live, where did she come from and where did she reside, what did she eat, and did she suffer from any diseases? Did she suffer a violent death? And how was she mummified and prepared for burial? Egypt is a land of contrasts. The River Nile, the cultivated strip of land beyond, and then the desert in the background. Ancient writers called Egypt the gift of the Nile because it's a country with very little rainfall, but every year the river, the Nile, flooded, uh, flooded the banks as the result of the inundation. This has been uh, stopped in more recent times. The waters are now held back behind dams uh, way down to the south, but in antiquity this was an annual natural event. The water uh, resulted in silt being deposited along the banks of the river. The Egyptians used this cultivated area for growing crops, uh, for keeping their animals and for living in their towns and villages and cities. They felt they could not sacrifice this very precious land for the burial of the dead. So the dead were taken out and buried on the edges of the desert with all their funerary goods. And because the desert is hot and dry, all of these items, the funerary items, have been preserved in a very good state of preservation uh, for many, many centuries. And this actually led to natural preservation of the body. We call this natural mummification, which in due course resulted in intentional mummification, where they went through several procedures in order to preserve the body. We turn now to Takabuti herself. This is her body coffin, and you can see there are two arrows here. Uh, these are the names and titles uh, of Takabuti. So the translation and detailed study of the coffin and the mummy have provided information about her life and death. And on the basis of the stylistic criteria and the inscriptions in, in hieroglyphs, the coffin can be dated to the 25th dynasty. According to the hieroglyphs, the mummy belonged to an elite woman named Takabuti. And uh, we can see here, the if you read from uh, this direction here, we can read the title, the name and title of Takabuti. So the coffin inscriptions provide reliable evidence about Takabuti's personal circumstances. We know from the coffin inscription that her father's name was Nespare and he was a priest of the god Amun. Uh, Amun uh, was the chief god of Egypt uh, in the 25th dynasty. Her mother's name was Tasen Irit, and both her parents were uh, dead or uh, deceased at the time of her own death. Now, she carried uh, the title of lady or mistress of the house and also noblewoman. So the coffin evidence indicates that she was a married woman from the middle ranks of the elite and that she would have supervised a substantial home and household. Takabuti lived in times of great political uncertainty and upheaval. 
a new power had emerged in a place called Kush, uh, which was part of Nubia. Uh, in modern times, this is uh, the area of northern Sudan, uh, just south of the Egyptian border. And the Kushites established a capital city at a place called Napata, uh, which is also known as Gebel Barkal. Later, they moved northwards uh, to conquer Egypt. And different Kushite rulers over a period of time kept pushing upwards into Egypt to try to uh, conquer and take over the country. Eventually, they succeeded. Uh, a man called Shabaka, who was the Kushite ruler, finally established himself uh, as king of Egypt and he established the 25th dynasty. And the dates for this are around 755 down to 656 BCE. The Kushite rulers had believed themselves to be the heirs of Egyptian kings who ruled in this area in the 18th dynasty. Uh, the dates for that are 1569 down to 1315 BCE. But Egypt lost control of the area in the 20th dynasty. The Kushites adopted aspects of ancient Egyptian civilization. For example, they promoted a local form of the Egyptian god Amun, and they expanded and refurbished his temple at Gebel Barkal or Napata, uh, which had fallen into disrepair after the Egyptians lost control of the area around 1081 BCE. You can see in the left hand slide uh, this uh, temple of Amun uh, at Gebel Barkal. Uh, Gebel Barkal was the sacred mountain, uh, the location uh, for Napata, and this is shown clearly uh, in the right hand slide. The Kushite rulers also adopted the practice of building pyramids for their royal burials. The Egyptians had introduced this custom, of course, thousands of years before, around 2800 BC. And the most famous are the group of pyramids at Giza, which you can see in the left hand slide. But the Egyptians ceased to build royal pyramids from around 1550 BCE. However, the Kushite rulers ruling in Egypt returned from Egypt back to Napata to be buried there in their own pyramids. And you can see one example of this uh, in the right hand slide. Since Takabuti's mummy and coffin were bought at Luxor in the 1830s, it's most likely that she and her family lived at Thebes. Her father was a priest of Amun, and he most likely served in the god's great temple at Karnak. The god Amun was a creator god, who sometimes represented uh, by a ram, as you can see in the right-hand image. The name for every Egyptian temple was House of the God, and each temple was regarded as the god's home. The temples were never used as places of congregational worship. Every temple was also believed to be the place of creation, where creation had actually taken place at the beginning of time. This place of creation was believed to be an island with very abundant vegetation. And this is especially represented in the plant forms of the stone columns and capitals that you see in the Egyptian temples. And an example is shown here uh, in the left hand image from the Temple of Amun at Karnak. The Temple of Amun at Karnak had been greatly enhanced and expanded by booty brought back from earlier Egyptian military campaigns. The Kushite rulers established their Egyptian capital at Thebes, and the Temple of Amun at Karnak became their prime religious centre. You can see images of it here, the magnificent buildings of which it's comprised. The priests had no pastoral or congregational duties. 
Their prime role was to attend to the gods' daily needs, providing food and offerings uh, to the deity. The Temple of Amun employed many people. Senior priests undertook liturgical duties and performed the daily rituals for the gods. This was a duty delegated from the king to the priesthood. Lower orders of priests, which probably included Takabuti's father, were known as servants of the god, and they assisted with the religious ceremonies, and they supervised the renovation, decoration and cleaning of the temple. Some individual priests had special duties. For example, Nessia Moon, uh, a mummy in the Leeds Museum, was overseer of the sacred cattle that were kept and slaughtered for the god's meals. And you can see the reconstruction of his uh, head, his face, uh, in the central image. Many priests were part-time and had second careers, uh, either as doctors or lawyers or teachers, and they served on a rota system uh, within the temple. They usually married and had families and lived in the vicinity of the temple building. Food for the daily offerings to the gods was produced on the temple estates. Once it had been offered as three meals uh, every day to the god's statue in the temple sanctuary, then it was taken outside the building and divided up amongst the priests as their payment. They took these rations home, and so they and their families dined on the best food in the land. Takabuti would have enjoyed a comfortable and affluent childhood as the daughter of a priest. Thebes was a major political, economic and religious centre. The urban populations lived in densely occupied townhouses or locally in the countryside. Domestic buildings were built of perishable materials, such as brick or wood, so relatively few examples have survived. Information provided by tomb wall scenes and tomb models, uh, three examples are shown here, uh, show us that the houses had flat roofs and stairs to give access to the roof. Takabuti's family may have lived in a spacious two-storied villa. Design features kept the houses cool. For example, they had central courtyards and wind catchers, uh, which you can see in the central image here. There would be a reception area for entertaining visitors, women's quarters, washing and bathing rooms, uh, kitchen and cellars and granaries. The house was usually surrounded by formal gardens with flowering plants and shrubs. Some at the centre of sizeable estates would have employed many domestic and outdoor servants. Tomb scenes show elite entertainment at home. This was to ensure that the deceased tomb owner could go on enjoying these pleasures in the next life. The scenes often include banquets. Uh, here, for example, you can show servants preparing the ladies of the house for a banquet. The food would have included vegetables, fruit, meat and poultry, uh, bread and cakes, and wine and beer. The hosts and their guests wore fine linen clothes and a lot of jewellery. The dress styles doubtless uh, developed and evolved over the millennia, but there's little surviving evidence of what they were wearing in the 25th dynasty. So was Takabuti's clothing similar to these earlier examples? Uh, we really don't know. Their heads were usually shaven and they wore wigs, these dark wigs uh, on top. But Taka Beauty unusually retained her own golden hair, and it seems unlikely that she wore a wig on top of her own hair. Egyptians were preoccupied with personal hygiene, beauty care and cosmetics. Evidence of this 
is available in uh, Takabuti's Mummy. She has manicured nails and a hairstyle set into neat artificial curls, which are coated with hair gel. She was doubtless the owner of a wide range of cosmetics. Much earlier examples are shown in these images here. They come from the pyramid workman's town of Cahoon, uh, about 1800 uh, BCE. So on the left, we've got a comb and jars with eye makeup inside. In the centre, there's a mirror with a handle representing Hathor, the goddess of love and beauty. And in the right hand image, there's a makeup box with berries and a stick for applying eyeliner. The Assyrians emerged as a powerful new enemy uh, in the north of the region, uh, roughly the region today of modern uh, Iraq. And at first, the Egyptians and the Assyrians were on good terms. But Egypt went on to support uh, its client states in the area of Syria-Palestine, and Assyria had to take action against this. So they dealt with it by attacking Egypt, and this went on uh, over a period from 671 BCE. Finally, an Assyrian ruler, Ashurbanipal, sent a campaign uh, which succeeded in conquering Egypt, and it was incorporated then into the Assyrian Empire, which you can see on the map. To Harker, the Kushite ruler of Egypt was driven out of Egypt and he fled back to Kush. The Assyrian uh, troops returned sometime later to sack Memphis and Thebes because Taharqa had continued to try to make trouble for them uh, in Egypt. And with this final sacking of Thebes, uh, the end of this era came about and the 25th dynasty was brought to a conclusion. The Assyrian Empire was built on formidable military force and advanced weaponry. A key feature uh, was the Assyrian uh, army, and they introduced wide-scale use of iron weaponry. This gave them great advantage over their enemies, who were still largely dependent on bronze weapons. Assyrians incorporated many features of earlier civilizations in the area where they lived, that is Mesopotamia or modern Iraq. And this was especially true of the Babylonian Empire. Uh, they included art, architecture, writing systems, medicine and religious beliefs and practices that had existed uh, under the Babylonians. And in the image here you can see uh, a drawing a modern drawing of the walls of Babylon and a ziggurat temple of the god Bel. So, during Takabuti's lifetime, she would have lived out her days against a background of warfare which was brought right to her home of, of Thebes. And we can see uh, some examples here of the Assyrian uh, fight. Uh, on the right-hand image, we can see this wall relief from Nimrud in Iraq, which is now in the British Museum. And this shows an Assyrian charge in action. On the left-hand side, there is an Assyrian helmet, now in the Manchester Museum collection, which was discovered at Thebes, uh, presumably from the time when the Assyrian troops uh, took the city. So, did Takabuti die in the Assyrian siege of Thebes? That's something we're going to be looking at and exploring further today. As an elite person, Takabuti's body was mummified with great care. The body would have been taken from her house when she died to the embalmer's workshop and there it would have been prepared uh, over a period of between 40 and 70 days, some of that time being taken up with religious rituals. And then the mummy would have been placed inside a body-shaped, or as we say, anthropoid coffin. 
and the family and the mourners would then have taken it and accompanied it uh, to uh, the tomb uh, alongside all the funerary goods that were going to make up her burial assemblage. The burial place of Takabuti's mummy and coffin are unknown. However, as they were purchased in Luxor in the 1830s, that's the modern town that replaced ancient Thebes, it's most likely that her tomb was situated somewhere on the west bank directly across the river. This is a desolate area used extensively over the millennia as a burial site and it contains the valleys of the kings and the queens. Many 25th dynasty burials were located near the temple of Queen Hatshepsut at Der el Bahri, which you can see here in the image. When Takabuti's funerary entourage arrived at the tomb, the mourners would have shared a final meal with her. Priests would have performed special rites to ensure that her soul had a safe passage into the next world. According to Egyptian belief, this was situated below the western horizon, and here Takabuti would expect to experience and enjoy a trouble-free eternity.